Welcome to the Apostolate's Peace of Heart Forum Classic Series, where hundreds of key personalities in the church share insights and wisdom from classic spiritual literature. These experts are interviewed by the Apostolate's founder from a unique family perspective so that the spiritual insights shared can be applied to our everyday lives and give us peace of heart. Let's now join the discussion. Hello, I'm Jerry Conacher. I want to welcome you to this program where we're talking about preparation for total consecration to Jesus through Mary for families. And uh, we're taking you through this journey. We're asking everyone to get this book and to set aside time every day to read, to meditate, to reflect, and then share your insights at dinner time with your children and talking about what you got out of the previous day's meditations. And we're here with Father Hugh Gillespie, who is a missionary, uh, Montford missionary. Thank you, Father, for being with us. And uh, Father Bernard Geiger is certainly an expert in consecration, been thinking about it all of his adult life and writing on it. And Father, we're into now part one, days one through 12, devoting 12 days mm -hmm. uh, for the spirit of the mm -hmm. world. So maybe you can share your insights on that. Yes, and I, I'd like to give a little bit more background on this. And then um, the other thing I think we want to do is we want to actually just look at what's going to meet the reader okay. when, uh, when they open to these pages because mm -hmm. it can be a little overwhelming at first glance. Right, right. Um, in the entire process of consecration um, that Montfort talks about, there are two basic movements, Montfort would say. Mm -hmm. The first movement, the preliminary movement, is we empty ourselves of the spirit of the world. And that, Montfort says, is absolutely necessary for the second movement, which is we allow God to fill us with the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so the, these are the two goals. We empty ourselves of the fi false idols of the world, the false values of the world. It doesn't mean we reject the world as a wicked and completely evil place as God's mm -hmm. creation. Mm -hmm. But Montfort wants us to set aside all of those things that master our time and our persons so that we can fill ourselves with the life of Jesus and begin to live that in its fullness. It's important to recognize that. And Montfort says you should spend about or at least 12 days. He doesn't give us a fixed time. Mm -hmm. So while he recommends 12, this number isn't sacred. Yeah, so he's flexible. In exactly. Sense, right? But what he wants, what he recognizes though is it takes time. Mm -hmm. And so he wants us to set aside several days, a solid amount of time before we move any further, he doesn't want us to be in a hurry to run forward and try to grasp Jesus. If our hands are so full of things, mm -hmm. we can't hold him. Yes. Um, and so he's going to say, take some time and make sure you do this. That's what the whole point then of this initial phase, spirit of the world is all about. Right. Now, how do we do that? Uh, Montfort says, one of the things we do is we look at our values. We look at our values and we, ask the question of which ones are authentic and which ones aren't. But it's a grace to understand this. Yes. And this too is a gift from God. Now as we open our books and we come to this section on Spirit of the World, mm -hmm. and we open up, for example, on page 17 to the first day, mm -hmm. you know, the initial reaction could be, oh wow, that's a lot to read. Yeah, right. uh, and you turn the page and you go, there's more. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> um, the way the days are structured is there's a meditation from the writings of Pope John Paul, yes. followed by a section from the writings of St. Louis de Montfort. Right. And these are going to run in tandem each of the days through this period. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to take some time to allow the tradition of the church, to allow the insights of Louis de Montfort to feed us and to guide us in our reflection. But as we noted last time, this is a lot of words and a lot of concepts. John Paul II was a very dense writer. Yes. Right. And he can put an awful lot of thought into a few paragraphs. Mm -hmm. If in reading this, one gets to a certain point and one says, you know, I have enough to chew on, That's stop it. there. That's right. You stop there. All. Because one of the fruits of this practice is a healthy spiritual freedom. Mm -hmm. We don't need to force feed ourselves. Yes. Right. Okay. What we want to do is we want to get the core insights on every given day and make sure we have enough time and energy to really pray through them and reflect on them. Right. The one piece I would recommend that we do not neglect are the scripture verses, mm -hmm. right. okay? Because here is the word of God that feeds us. Right. On a given day, we can set, you know, 
the writings of the Holy Father aside. We can set Louis de Montfort aside. Mm -hmm. We don't want to set the Word of God aside. Mm -hmm. um, because that's where the Spirit most directly and most powerfully communicates to us. Yes. Um, but as we look at the structure of this 12-day period, this initial period of the Spirit of the World, one of the things that's particularly powerful about this arrangement mm -hmm is not, that, not just that we have a combination of papal texts in dialogue with the words of Montfort <coughs> illumined by the sacred scriptures. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a useful format and a useful structure. Right. But the way that the issue of spirit of the world is treated as we go through this section is very important and it's not the way that many will typically do it. Often when we look at the issue of the spirit of the world, we're looking completely inwardly and we're saying, what have I bought into? Yet one of the beautiful things in the vision of Pope John Paul is that he has a very great way of globally looking at the realities within our presently existing world. Mm -hmm. And he's not just gonna speak in the abstract. Mm -hmm. And so we begin this section by simply talking about the reality of sin and suffering in the world and the need for reconciliation. This is a reality that every family also knows. Um, but, you know, it's also a reality that marks our world. Yes. The violence on our city streets, um, the violence that we see in every corner of the world, and not just the physical violence, but the smoldering violence and resentments we have in so many places where injustice has been experienced. You know, and, and then the indifference which allows this to continue. You know, that is very much a part of the spirit of the world. That's very much a part of the world in which we live. And so the interesting thing is we have our Holy Father naming these realities. Mm -hmm. And then we have these writings from Montfort where he speaks about the reign of Jesus or the presence of Mary in our lives. And he, what he does is they form a counterpoint yes, or know. a contrast. Here's the worldly reality we struggle against and which can oppress us so easily. And here's the counter voice. The reality of God which can change this, which can transform this, which can set us free from mm -hmm. this. But then as we move through, some surprising things happen. We talk not just about the classic realities of violence, of selfishness, but we begin talking about the lack of mercy that one finds in the world mm -hmm. and God's hunger to bring his mercy into the world and the fact that one of the other realities is as our world is hungering for mercy. Our world very often is crying and longing for justice, but it doesn't know where to lift its voice. There's a great hunger for spirituality in the world, but it's often met by that which is less than fully healthy. And in our desire for spiritual food, our world often drinks from the wrong well. And, um, and so it never satisfies itself. And this too, you know, this good and bad blended in our world, this real desire for the holy, mm -hmm. this real desire for justice, and yet the short-sighted, and half-hearted ways where we try to get justice or our inability by our own efforts to make the world just. This too is part of the reality of the world that our Holy Father names. Now the other remarkable thing in the passages here are these wonderful quotes that talk about the vocation of the call for holiness of the Christian and the call for Christian service in the world. Mm -hmm. And one would say, well, what does that have to do with renouncing the spirit of the world? Yeah. Again, it's that note of contrast. And the beautiful thing in the vision of John <coughs> Paul II is he sees the world not only as the arena in which sin and injustice have asserted themselves, but it's also the arena where grace asserts itself. Mm -hmm. It's the place where we live. And one of the things we want to do as we go through this process is recognize our families live in the world. And at the end of this process, our families will continue to live in the world. The question is, how do we live in the world as leaven mm -hmm. without being mastered by the false values, by the economic self-seeking, by the exploitation of the poor, by the steady recourse to violence which holds us hostage, how do we live in a world such as this without despair? Mm -hmm. How do we live in a world such as this 
as true agents of the kingdom. And that's really, if I understand the order and the arrangement of these texts correctly, as one moves through these first 12 days, these are the kind of questions that present themselves to us. Right, it, it's, it's, John Paul is a great philosopher. And, and I just, and, and I, as I read this again, and then over and over again, and De Montfort just, <laughs> he's so concrete. Yes. And it, it's, a, it's a beautiful combination. And I just, uh, Father Bernard, in this whole section of uh, spirit of the world, ridding ourselves, you have any insights in that? Well, yes, the, the readings uh, help us to focus in on what that spirit of the world is and, uh, and what, is, what it isn't, mm -hmm. what we need to look to. And uh, I don't focus on any particular thing right at the moment, but uh, it is a, a wonderful preparation as, as we get into this and try to figure out, because in any case, if we're going to go somewhere, we have to figure out where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. And this, that's what this first part is. Where are we coming from? And where are we going to go? Right. And <clears throat> what are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to get there? Well, we, uh, we use the, um, some of his writings on reconciliation and penance. And that um, was a mysterious decision that he made when he was shot on, in 1981 on May 13th. He went to Fatima the next year, and he said, and it's, nobody ever picked up on it, but it's in his speeches. He said the next synod of bishops will be on the Fatima message, reconciliation and penance. And then he declared an extraordinary holy year, mm -hmm. and that's when he brought the statue of Our Lady of Fatima to Rome during the March 25th of that, uh, of that extraordinary holy year, and um, consecrated the world in 1984. And uh, so this is right on de Montfort's uh, <laughs> February feast day there, but this reconciliation, we will not reconcile with one another, one another until we reconcile with God. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we just, it's, it's, it's there. And, and he used, he used the, um, he always has a scripture in every one of his documents and he weaves it through the whole thing. And he, you know, it's amazing how he works it through one scripture. And uh, this was a prodigal son. And uh, he ended with uh, the, the statement that uh, talking about the prodigal, the other son that didn't ever leave his father. But he said, we don't know if that son ever made it to union with the father. We know the prodigal son did, <laughs> but we know the sinner did. But we know, don't know if the other one did. And that was a real note, a sobering note to those that are really trying to do their best, but will have a tendency to look down on others that have fallen. Right. Well, John Paul wove that through, and it's just ingenious. He, he, he runs so deep, and that's why um, it's good just to take it, and you can't read it all. You just meditate right. on part of it. Now, there's, um, there's a couple other notes that are worth kind of sounding out mm -hmm. here as we talk about this process of, spirit of the, uh, looking at the spirit of the world. Yeah. The first note is context. Mm -hmm. And uh, I indicated that in some of my, my remarks just a few minutes ago. But one of the things that um, this initial stage really forces us to do is to look at the context of our lives. Mm -hmm. What is dominating my life? What values are really controlling me? What is dictating the events of my day? Um, is it choices that I'm making or am I carried along on a sea of events? You know, are others always deciding for me? And just reacting on Exactly. And here I'm not speaking of the case in a family where you have the, school, the, the young children and mom and dad have to make decisions. Yeah, right. Here I'm talking about mom and dad. Mm -hmm. You right. know, and is our family being swept <coughs> up by things that are just completely out of our control? Mm -hmm. um, because this is one of the things that's going on here. Um, what values are our children coming back home from school mm -hmm. with? Right. Um, what, what values am I exposed to every day in the office? Mm -hmm. What is the context, the context of my living? Because there are a lot of pressures that impinge upon us today. Mm -hmm. And after a while, we can just grow numb to them. And we make our, our series of uneasy compromises, which become easy compromises mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I could say religious life was immune from that, but that's not either. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to keep renewing ourselves and keep looking at the context of my living. You know, what are the pressures on me? What are the, 
what are the tugs I feel so persistently that can so easily pull me or my family or my children off course? That's a big part of what this time is about. And so it's not just a matter of reading these documents and getting a taste of Pope John Paul II's magnificent vision mm -hmm. of the realities of the world or, or Louis de Montfort's beautiful language of Jesus and Mary. That's all important. But what's really important is that we bring the light of that to bear yes. on our lives and say, which forces of resentment in my heart are preventing me from simply loving my family members? Which, um, which pressures at work are causing me to drop my values and to do things I said I would never do? Um, the next is in, um, in Louis de Montfort's poetic works, his hymns, mm -hmm. he has a number of hymns dealing with the issue of the world, mm -hmm. as, uh, again, as this ambient in which we find ourselves. But there's a very important theme he comes back to time and time again. And one sees it even in areas where Montfort is writing a hymn condemning dance. Mm -hmm. Now, one can accuse Montfort of being a little too stiff here. <laughs> right. But his real point with a number of these things was not that they're bad in themselves, but how a number of things, even gambling, when he talks about gambling, it's not just a matter of what it does to our material wealth, but what it does to our time. And the amount of time so many things in our lives begin to claim. Right. And the reality is what masters my time, masters me. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. Um, and what we're running into more and more today is people are saying over and over again, I have no time for myself. And even worse, I don't know how many mothers tell me, I don't feel like I have a right to time for myself. The first act of renunciation of the spirit of the world in this process is no written meditation in this book. The first act is making the time mm -hmm. to say, I'm going to do this. Right. And to say that this is time for my family. This is time for me. Because in the back of my mind, there's going to be that voice that says, isn't there a better thing to do with this time? Mm -hmm. There's all, and, you know, whenever I start to do something spiritually, you know, people who haven't called me in years start calling <laughs> me, you know? And, uh, and these distractions. And, right, and, right. And, and you know, there's, there's a million little things to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, at times, these are necessary things and one has to do them. But other times, one needs to discern and say, you know, that's not as important as the need for quiet space and space to renew myself. Mm -hmm. and, and that is such a lost art today where we're so busy. We, we live in noise, either with the cell phone in the car on the way to work or the radio on and the noise of work. And we work longer and longer hours with smaller and smaller break times. No, it's the, the economy is really right. crunching down. And you know, and with my cell phone and my beeper and my email account, I'm always connected. Right. And so I'm never completely turned off mm -hmm. to all of these things. And and there's this notion that somebody can intrude on my life at any moment. Right. And I'm afraid of disconnecting myself because I don't want to miss something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the old the old example used to be the television. Yeah. But as we're getting more and more wired, computer, yeah, right. um, it's becoming harder and harder simply to say, I don't need to fill my life with sound. Mm -hmm. I don't need to fill my day with activity. In fact, sometimes the most important act of freedom I can make is the freedom to say, I do not need these chains. Mm -hmm. And my family doesn't need them either because what happens in our families now? There's this incredible centrifugal pull that separates us from one another yeah. because we're all pulled in so many different directions. So the other piece yeah. here is not just saying, what time do I have on any given day, but what time collectively do we have for the family? And you know, maybe it's just a couple hours on Sunday or maybe it's at a certain point of time in the week, but if there's no time, you know, that's another piece we need to look at because here all of a sudden something else Will come in. Is dominating us, and what controls our time controls, controls our life. Right, and I think this is this is so important because the economy is is rushing so much now. As we're outsourcing everything, people are being fired, and they have to work longer hours mm -hmm. to make the same kind of income. Um, but we can take that drive time, turn off your cell phone, 
right. and, and take that drive time and, uh, and reflect as well. And we're getting, we do have this recorded uh, that they can download it through the computer and we read it to them. <laughs> right. So they can put it into their iPod and, and read that and, uh, and as they're driving. But I think that this, uh, this idea of the world is, is crushing in on us so many ways mm -hmm. and this is an opportunity now as a family to um, think about it, pray about it, and set some achievable goals uh, to uh, reserve more time for the family. It's hard. Sports is taking up. Oh, you know, it really things. is. It, it's not. It's not just the economy. It's all yeah. the activities. It's yeah. all the right. information we now have access to. Yeah. And it's a culture that says you need to satisfy the whim of the moment when you have it. Right. Um, yeah. Television is dominating, and computers, and so it is. It's setting goals to. Um, have that quiet time with the Lord. And it's amazing that the Holy Spirit whispers to us and the devil yells at us, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> through the music and everything else. Well, we have three more minutes, Father. We did a whole show on this spirit of the world. Maybe you just want to share some other insights on that, just what you've gotten from true devotion to Mary and how de Montfort treats that. Well, one of these scripture passages, actually it's, one parable that Jesus tells that Matthew and Luke both tell differently mm -hmm. that I love working with uh, this particular movement in the process of preparation mm -hmm. is the parable of the ruler who invites his friends to a wedding banquet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way Luke tells the story is much more gentle than Matthew. Matthew's rough. <laughs> um, but Luke tells the story that the invitation comes and the first guy gets and says, oh, that's really nice. There's a wedding. But, you know, I just bought a field and I got to go check it out. Mm -hmm. And the next person says, you know, this is really good, but, you know, we have, uh, we have a lot of orders coming in for the business, so I can't go. Mm -hmm. And what Luke does is he gives us this laundry list of the classic excuses we make, mm -hmm. which on themselves are perfectly reasonable, perfectly justifiable, right. which lead to us being shut out mm -hmm. simply because we don't bother to respond. We say something's more important yes. than the invitation we receive. And it's a wonderful way of looking at the way just the ordinary affairs of our lives can fill to dominate our time and our attention so much that when the Lord invites us, we say, no, I just can't make it, and we have a perfectly reasonable sounding excuse. Mm -hmm. It's subtle, yeah. and it's real. Matthew then tells the same story, but he's sharper. The invitation comes, and the messengers are beaten. <laughs> and the messengers are killed. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and so we, we've gone beyond the, mo the point of being reasonable. Mm -hmm. But Matthew's, Matthew's way of telling the story reminds us, though, that there's also that persistent sinfulness in our lives mm -hmm. which wants to silence the Word of God, which will not let the Word of God speak because we know it's going to make a change in us. Right. And, uh, and there's also that persistent element of the world in which we live, which is the same way. A person begins to change or question values and priorities, and right away it's don't go there. You're yeah. not allowed. Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep your job? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, but there's an incredible hostility at times in the world to the gospel, and there's an incredible hostility in our hearts. Mm -hmm. But there's also just this quiescent indifference. I'm so caught up in the affairs of the day, I have no time to be troubled by anything else even if it's something as wonderful as an invitation from God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are two ways of looking at the spirit of the world, and I think they're important ways yes. because they're connected. It's not just the obvious hostility of the world we worry about, but I think Luke's story is more appropriate for us many times today because our lives are so often surrendered in that same way. I really should take more time to pray, but you know I'm so busy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it's precisely this lesson that says, you know, let's be careful how often we use that excuse and the way we use it. Right. We, we have to give it to, we have to really give it to the family. This family consecration can allow us to talk about this at dinner time and how we do have to set aside more time for what is important in our lives and use this as an opportunity. So we're just saying, do your readings, you can't get to all of them, just read what the Spirit moves you. Commit to a certain time, 20 minutes, a half hour, even 10 minutes a day uh, of reading. And then stop and when you're moved, share it the next day at dinner time with your family. 
and um, help them to grow with you. This, uh, this will, in that sharing time, you're probably going to get so much from that, synergizing with your husband, your wife, and your children on these truths that will make us free. So thank you for going with us, and please visit our website at familyland.org. Uh, this is also on the web. You can download it, print it off, record it, go on your iPod. We've done everything to make this easy for you. It's there. God bless you.